Good morning. Welcome to the uh, John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat on uh, Saturday morning at 10 at uh, uh, November 10th, uh, 2018. Today our special guest will be uh, Paul Schroeder and uh, he'll be talking about the nature of the electron and uh, um, before we uh, turn the program over to him, uh, for those of you who may be new coming to this uh, presentation uh, for the first time on the internet or uh, wherever you might be seeing it, uh, we, uh, the Chappelle uh, Natural Philosophy Society uh, was originally founded as the Natural Philosophy Alliance by John Chappelle and some other people. And uh, it was created because of the feeling that uh, modern science was uh, deviating from truth and getting too far afield from reality. And so uh, in our organization, we present, uh, we, have, we present people that give alternative views of uh, various uh, scientific topics and theories. And uh, this is to help us discover uh, a better form of science than the truth that uh, we get from the politically correct science of this day. And uh, unfortunately, the scientific method has been changed in the last 150 years so that uh, we first went to the existential scientific method and then to the postmodern uh, scientific method. And both of these largely exclude the role of logic in science. And without logic, there cannot be any truth. And so uh, we, we find that's a, a flaw. And, uh, so we're trying to present new, new methods, new approaches that help us get closer to truth. And so at this point, I would like to introduce Paul Schroeder. And he would give us some of his background, at both education and work-wise. Uh, that would be helpful. And then also uh, the kind of uh, papers he has published and uh, that sort of thing. OK, Paul, we'd like to hear from you at this time. Hey, thank you, Bill. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me now because we've had some. I can hear you fine. I think everybody can hear you. OK. Um, Background, I guess I've been with the NPA, CNPS, uh, about 10 years. I came in because I had uh, a lot of, developed, personally, a lot of uh, theories about uh, gravity, uh, the speed of light, and um, chose the NPA at that time as a place to uh, share some of my thoughts. Um, my background is uh, I'm a go math major from Beloit College in Wisconsin. And uh, I have uh, a lot of papers that have been posted through NPA, various functions of gravity. And it gets so different. It's more of a philosophy, as many people will say. And it's very different from many of the standard models that physics uses. And it's not built around math. And it's not built around experiments. It's built around the reality of things in together with look at physics itself. Anyway, in this particular topic, uh, extension on my thinking about uh, radiation and that EM radiation. Uh, Talked the last couple of weeks about uh, radiation as I get interested in the flow of things, the motion of things, and try and make sense out of that. And in that 
they, I took uh, radiation and realized that it comes everywhere in the universe from everywhere and fills out the universe. Uh, light does that and a lot of other frequencies of uh, EM radiation also that. So, I have an overview I've presented so far of motions and the flowing throughout the universe. And, it, and I lead it at the fact that uh, uh, radiation is everywhere, including inside masses, and radiation creates push and creates gravity, and so that goes in a lot of directions done a number of times in the past, but I've done that as part of. Um, so continuing to focus on radiation, uh, this presentation is to take a look at one particular beam within all of this radiation. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, Kind of uh, starting on the uh, slideshow that uh, you see up there. Uh, but I, I just got beeping from um, my f wife getting a phone call. Uh, you want me to put the slide presentation up? It's not on your screen, is it? it she's got it. Uh, she, she, she'll take care of it. She knows she's not. Got to use her cell phone. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, in order to take a look at uh, the single beam of, of radiation, um, what, I, what I'm trying to accomplish is to look at a very high frequency beam. So, if you if you think about light. Uh, a lot of times that's pictured by a uh, sine wave, uh, a, a nice rolling uh, wave that uh, has ups, uh, highs and lows and uh, goes on forever. And what I'm trying to do is get the beams, the high points or the closer together. Clearly, the way you do that is to have uh, a higher frequency beam, so maybe we're even talking about x-rays here. And uh, well, I, what I want you to do in order to be able to follow this is to get a decent picture of what I'm going to talk about. And to get that decent picture, uh, we want the beams, I mean the waves, to be very narrow and right close to each other. So I said, well, the, the width of a thick maybe, or uh, I gave an example of um, as my graph, you know, where it goes up and down, but that, that's not a good example, especially because the high points, uh, the altitudes, waves, or to be the same height all the way along. So in any case, what I want to do is, in your mind, create up and down of three waves adjacent to each other, left to the right number waves, one, two, and three. And then the, 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 just assume this whole thing flows on forever, right, beam itself carries these waves. Part of it, they're all part of it, but it, you have these waves one, two, and three adjacent to each other. Full motion within the waves is it goes up the first wave and down the back end of the first wave and up the second wave and down the th second wave and so f so forth. And uh, the waves, the overall flow is, of course, the speed of light uh, or the speed of EM radiation, which is uh, C. Uh, 
case, extending these waves on, you can extend these waves on forever. They continue forever without change unless there's some kind of interference with the waves. Uh, in empty space, it's just but if you got interference, something different happens. So we're going to look at the interference here, and it's going to be gravity. It's curves, and beams come somewhat near uh, mass or some matter. And, um, gravity, beam comes past, gravity be bends the beam itself, the whole, the whole set of it's um, with Einstein's idea that uh, mass does redirect light beams, and he did it coming toward us from some long distance. Proved it by uh, stars not being their place. In any case, we're accepting that. Uh, Beams are bent by gravity. Uh, the beam flow direction vary under the influence of masses depending on the local amount of net gravity. So if, you, if you're close to the body itself, the bend will be more than if you're up higher in the atmosphere and so forth. Um, so uh, how do we control uh, going on to the next one of these? Uh, Just Bill, you next slide, please, <laughs> and I'll turn, turn, change it. Okay. Well, we're going to bending. All right. Is this the one you want? Yeah, it, it blacks out the. Oh, is there a picture or something up here? Ah, here we go. <laughs> Let me put oh, okay. this down at the bottom. How's okay. That? There we go. All right. So this is. Uh, this uh, is the bending. Uh, gravity bends light, and thus it bends any radiation beams. Just a little bit. Waves have altitudes, and altitude is obviously they're high relative to the main beam, so they're perpendicular to the beam, and so two waves next to each other have parallel uh, altitude. Oh, that's where you get any uh, interference, but if you get some gravity interference that bends the whole beam itself, all the two waves next to each other be quite parallel like they were before, these toothpicks. Um, what can happen is wave bump up against its prior. So to picture this in your mind, draw a fourth wave. So we had one, two, and three. Now we're going to make wave four, and it's going to bend backwards a little bit. And that, that backward bend is going to make it actually bump, it, bump up against the wave before it. So wave four and a bump them into wave three, uh, the preceding wave. It's into the intersections. Uh, Paul, we're not hearing what you're saying. What's that? We didn't hear you say anything. I thought your mouth opened. So. <laughs> uh, oh, so now we've got a problem with the phone? No, it's working, not, it's working fine now. It's not working fine. Maybe I looked in the wrong direction because I have to look at the base of the telephone here, not use the receiver. Anyway, uh, we went from bendings to intersections now, please. There you go. Okay. 
intersections. A wave bending back might, as I have just said, contact the preceding wave. And this contact then is the upward line creating wave four and that the bumping up against the downward flow of that finishes wave three. So there's going to be this touching of the flow going in two different directions. And this uh, uh, two oppositely directed flows therefore force spin. And um, it's really suggesting some out of uh, electrical existence here. Um, so we can assume that more expensive bend, if we, we've had these two beams, or two waves touching each other, if we bend that wave four even more than we did for this discussion so far, uh, it will go, it will overlap the prior wave and goes beyond just contact. Now we get to electrons, the next screen. Oh, we're on, okay. Um, as wave four bends across a prior wave, it intersections, intersects wave three's flow. Ultimately, has to, so the, the upward flow of, in, Wave four is going to overlap somewhere on a downward part of wave three. And then to finish wave four, the, the, the wave itself finishes itself and comes back out of wave three and back down to its base point or starting point. So you have intersections. We have two crossings here of waves. And in both cases, the waves... Wave four flows in one direction when it's entering, and it flows oppositely uh, when exiting beam three. So both crossings are the, the down, across the downward path in wave, wave three, and they're both the upward and the downward path in wave four. So what you get is two different crossings that have opposite spins. And this physics designates as the two spin directions as one half and minus one half by these crossings. The number of electrons uh, uh, in matter and so forth, uh, and the whole quantum theory is built around the fact that uh, something like electrons is always numerically um, whole numbers. And um, in other words, electrons all have the same size or weight or whatever they measure them as. And so what you do for electrons is count how many you have here. And in this case, we have two crossings, so we have two electrons. And those electrons, uh, uh, the measure of electrons is either they exist or they don't exist. So we've got two as opposed to none. And it might have been one when they bumped up against each other. The next screen then is matter creation. Niels Bohr, uh, electron, and he assigned orbits and distances to electrons within the matter, leading to the per periodic table. Now, I have this bending that uh, creates the electrons. And if you have electrons, uh, have, uh, have matter in some way or other, uh, there's electrons, there's somehow got to be the rest of matter. That's, well, that's standard physics. So uh, electronic uh, EM waves, uh, the closer to the mass surface, the more the bending and the electron creation. In other words, we can have more bending if there's some. If there's not a clear-cut limit to how much bending back we can get. The closer we are to the mass that causes the gravity, the more bending we might get. Uh, 
Anyway, Earth's atmosphere is is constantly being recreated uh, as uh, by these electrons being created by the waves coming by and uh, bending and creating electrons that uh, may subsequently uh, decay or they may be brought down to the Earth by the gravity, but they're being created in our atmosphere. And actually also being created the closer to surface, uh, the more dense the electrons that are being created. We go on now to more electrons. The Bohr electron orbit with nucleus, or I'm sorry, electrons orbit the nucleus with increasingly distant shells. Now, shells is one thing, and shell subshells is something else to uh, Bohr system. Uh, subshells are the, uh, the the basic added amount, and then shells. Uh, can put together a couple of, uh, of the experiences of these electron creations to give you a group that's all at the same distance from a nucleus. Uh, shell one is is the two electrons that we have just discovered. Those are shell one, and that's the extent of shell one to Bohr. Now, if wave four angles back so it crosses into wave two along with wave three. So it's going to bend into two different waves. Uh, wave four flow then crosses up and down flows of wave three and the upflow of wave two. So there's really become six crossings. Going across wave three, then into wave two is three crossings, and then coming back out of all three of those is three more. So you have six crossings, and those six crosses, three of each of the kinds of spins. So uh, subshells. The second uh, subshell is labeled P, and it has ele six electrons. So therefore, we might say that we have just uh, created uh, subshell, uh, second subshell. Then this whole thing and go all the way from where four crosses three and two and one and into one and then back out, makes two crosses in, into and out of three, two crosses into and out of four, and one cross into one, three and two, and then one cross into one, and then back out of all of those. Uh, that is two, four, five, that's 10. I'm sorry, that's, that's t yeah, that's 10 electrons. So we have created then the third subshell by bending the whole thing more. and. So we start to understand that bending has a lot to do with matter and the whole idea that uh, uh, that there's actually uh, waves within matter that has been discussed in Paramount in recent years, uh, this sort of fits in with that, is it takes waves and crossings to really fully define what the mass is. Um, the shells uh, themselves, which are more than these subshells, number 2, 8, and 18. So the, looking at the second shell, 8, that consists of the subshell crossing 3 and the subshell crossing 2. So you've got 6 plus 2, and we arrive at the 8 by adding these. Uh, uh, also, we note that wave three has to cross. If, we're, if wave four is crossing back two waves to two, wave three then is forced to also lean back into wave two. So you've got two crossings by wave three into two and six crossings by wave four into two, giving us 10. And that gives you the shells as opposed to the subshells. 
crossings of multiple waves become assigned to one central region. So you have to, and it's not clear how like, atom really is de determined uh, from these waves. Some group of these waves makes the atom and therefore the nucleus. We get into, can we also discuss protons and neutrons? Well, all the crossing electrons are equal in size. At some portion of the, well, an electron is some portion of the loop flow because it, it it's like the loops are made out of a uh, thousand dots or particles, and we've hit one of them. So we now have um, created uh, an electron that weighs one eighteen hundredth of a, of of the whole loop, and maybe that loop then is a proton. Is a proton. Loop itself may provide may get divided into sections uh, represent these protons. Uh, it's not in any case the loops. Then, if the loop, loops represent the protons, then any loops within the, a conglomeration of of bending and so forth. If there are loops without crossings, uh, then they would represent. A neutron. A neutron is really the same as the original waves that were going through space and doing nothing, but when they get mixed in with a assortment of bending, then they become neutrons, parts of matter. In, uh, next is spectrum of existence. Uh, Wait a second. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's hard to work together. Thing. Uh, spectrum of existence. I have promoted the extension of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum in both directions, and I've had this for a long time. Um, you know, the spectrum goes from Sound waves, all the way up to X rays, but you know there's no specific end given to this whole series of uh, wavelengths uh, available. Obviously, the whole thing is based on simply a count of how many uh, waves within each. Uh, Well, anyway, this, uh, I have uh, extended the low end of the spectrum in such a way that says you can get all the way to, have, to waves that have no beams at all or, or one beam every mile or one wave every mile. So they're extremely sh low number, uh Frequency. They're extremely low frequency. Now, the value of these extremely low frequency beams is that when all the radiation comes up against matter, and let's assume that uh, you know other waves flow toward uh, Earth or toward the Sun, that when they get there, they're going to be stopped by the matter. And why are they stopped? Because they their their flow has waves and the, these waves kind of hit sideways and uh, they they no longer are, are the wave that they used to be. But if you don't have waves, you just got a long range um, beam, then it's kind of like thinking about an arrow going into matter and going right into distance and maybe going all the way through. Now, there are measures of the amount that uh, waves do penetrate uh, now, and, uh, and light has got some amount of penetration, extremely small, but penetration is a real issue. 
um, the penetrated mass diminishes the force of the radiation and when that radiation comes out the other side, it's not going to push upward as much as the other radiation coming from outer space pushes downwards in a 180 degree opposite direction. So you get a net imbalance of the pressure and a downward push, which is called gra attraction gravity at the exit point. So there's beams going in all sides of Earth, so you got exit points everywhere, so you got an equal attraction gravity everywhere. The other end is more relative to what we've been talking about today. The higher the frequency of waves, the less the need of bending in order to overlap and create elect electrons. Um, you have And so extremely high frequency waves, as we tried to discuss here, create matter almost instantaneously. And so at some point they become, they are matter. I mean, x-rays turn into matter with any amount of interference. So we go x-rays are potentially harmful rays. I always talk about their being shielded from the atmosphere. That is, their sh the shielding is essentially the conversion of them into mass. Further shielding and further, uh, okay, we've had all this bending occur because of gravity, but I'm not sure that that's a sufficient amount of bending to create some of the complicated matter. So what further actions can happen to our radiation is that they can be curved by colliding with other matter. And so therefore, uh, beams come across and they hit uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere and create more nitrogen because there's joint bending, things like that. Um, extreme curvature could uh, even curve back uh, circular things. Uh, this whole process of creating the electrons up in the atmosphere establishes when they're created, they're there. That's their point. They is, they set in that point and and. But the flow within the loops still continues on and can go on to infinity, but that point of that electron has been established. And that's the difference between matter and uh, radiation, is that matter has a place established for it, and radiation does not. Remaining in place is the difference between radiation and matter. Electrons remain while the beam continues to flow. Our uh, slide, uh, get into decay, uh, uh, you know, people like to talk about anti-gravity and so forth. Uh, since we are using bending uh, as a major component in coming, uh, leading to, uh, or bending and being a source to help make matter, then removing electrons or is done by lessening the amount of bend or curl of the matter form, which is these electrons are, are therefore the spin. So it's always a discussion also here of spin. So you're limiting the spin, therefore you get a less dense matter by straightening it out. Reducing bend suggests nuclear decay is available in some ways to all elements. If you could ever get it straightened out so that the electrons, so you can get rid of an electron, but that's not. Anyway, I guess that's really all. I got all, inter all interactions are a function of motion, and so therefore, example of motion's creating something. That would be the end. Okay. Uh, let me give a few 
uh, comments, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments from other people. Um, what I like about these uh, meetings that we have is we see um, different approaches, but very similar ideas. And so, for instance, the the work that he's doing is in some way similar to what Franklin, uh, who does, uh, he's making everything out of electrons. But if electrons are these the waveforms, um, then there's a relationship there. Uh, in, in the work that I have done, uh, I have found, uh, and experimentally this has been confirmed, that there are solitons, which are long-lived structures in the wave itself, in the electromagnetic wave. And these are in the shape of toroidal rings, at least we think they are, uh, as far as we can tell. And uh, everything is made of these shapes. And so your atoms and your elementary particles and nuclei, all of that is made uh, from the, these particular uh, wave shapes. And, uh, and then um, in the work that you've done, um, it's more qualitative than quantitative and to some extent in the sense that uh, uh, you don't describe uh, how all elementary particles are made and predict the complete set of the elementary particles because your structure is still um, not mathematically real uh, complete. Um, but uh, uh, in the kind of approach that I've taken, I've been able to predict uh, all 96 of the elementary particles that we can create and form beams of. We claim to create others, but we perform beams doing experiments with them or stuff like that. All we can do is say, well, this reaction, what we can't see is this particle. <laughs> and uh, th that sort of thing. But uh, so anyway, at this point, I'd like to open it up to the uh, rest of the people attending uh, in terms of questions and comments. Would uh, someone like to make a comment or, or, or ask a question? Uh, no, no comments, no uh, questions. <laughs> How about you, pal? Do you want to make a comment or, or share something? Yes, sir. Uh, aren't details worth expecting or something? I <laughs> Okay. Uh, Bill, can you hear me? Yes. So this is Bill Howell in Alberta. Um, I'm just trying to get used to the fuse on my cell phone. <laughs> um, yeah, I found the uh, presentation actually quite interesting. Um, uh, my problem is, uh, again, you refer to other work uh, similar to yours and Franklin Hughes. And uh, I guess I'd have to go through through the details again to uh, see that relationship between the uh, curvature, the waves, and, and mass. Uh, could you just go over that quickly, like a, a paragraph or so, just saying um, how that how that occurs? You've got these uh, waves, their interactions, their crossings, and a momentum that's creating created. But I'm not. Uh, a little bit confused about the directionality and <clears throat> like you tend to think in terms of a, a linear or a line of, of motion, um, but it, it sounds a bit like you're talking about a scattering type of an effect in three dimensions or, or what? Um, well, first of all, I would say that it might be a little helpful in the future if Paul had 
uh, pictures or drawings of some of these things. But um, in the work that I have done um, with the, the concept of a soliton, which is a standing wave, and you can make those in any fluid, in air, in water, uh, any, any type of fluid, you can make them and you can see them uh, if you use the right type of approach. And they look like a portal ring, uh, but like a uh, tornado, <laughs> we can see the funnel and we can say, oh, there's a ring in that funnel, you know. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, like a whole bunch of things on top of each other. And, uh, and you could say that the funnel is, is the tornado, but really it's not. The tornado is all the clouds and the structure and everything that is contributing to the tornado, and it goes for hundreds of miles. And, uh, and but the, 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 uh, the part that you see, the funnel is, you know, it's only a few feet, maybe 10, 20 feet across. And, uh, and we often say that's the thing. But uh, so anyway, in the case of the electron, in the work that I've done, the electron is composed of three of these toroidal rings. And they all have a charge of what we would call the electron charge over three, one third of the electron charge. And so the sum of the three is equal to the total charge of the electron. And the mass of the electron uh, using the, uh, we can derive the equation that energy equals mc squared. Well, the mass is is the, is the, the kinetic energy of the three solitons, which are waves, uh, as they are bound together. But because they all have the same so-called charge, uh, they repel one another too. They have both the magnetic force and the electrical force. And the magnetic force is able to hold it together, but not very strongly. If we had uh, like a proton, which has plus and minus charges, a soliton range in it, uh, you can get a much uh, stronger uh, energy of vibration of the solitons together. So the difference there is um, um, the mass is is uh, determined by this the structure and the the ancient Greeks said that everything was made of monads and the monads uh, only combined in certain geometrical structures. So if you know what those structures are, you can predict all the structures and the masses and the number of elementary particles there's going to be, and that's what I do on my papers on elementary particles, and I predict. 96 different elementary particles that have all been observed and I predict a few that haven't been observed but they're out of the energy range of our experiments so far. So so that's kind of how you see that. Does someone else want to make a comment? Okay. Bill, huh? oops, sorry. Go ahead. I have a comment. Okay, Harry. I wish somebody would define a wave before talking about waves. What is a wave? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, uh, the, the person who did the most interesting work on that was at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, uh, his name was... Uh, William, I can't think of the last name. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, what he did is he measured 13 properties of electric and magnetic fields. And one of those properties was uh, the fact that the field has tension. That means the field cannot be cut. It is continuous. That is a different property than we normally think of. So like uh, someone like um, 
uh, Franklin would say, oh, the, the ether and everything is made of, of uh, electrons and positrons, and, and they're particles, and uh, they're, they're discontinuous. They, you know, they're close, they can be close to each other, but there's a separation between them. And uh, just like you have a separation between uh, billiard balls or something like that. And, uh, but uh, that this uh, um, experiments that were done at the University of California at Berkeley showed that uh, there, there are 13 properties and there are, there are three types of electric fields and three types of magnetic fields. And some can be shielded, some cannot. Uh, all are uh, continuous and have tensile strength. And that's what enabled these um, structures like solitons to exist. Uh, just like in the atmosphere, you have a, uh, a some tensile strength between molecules in the atmosphere, and uh, that helps make these structures like tornadoes, and hurricanes, and things like that. Um, the and if you look at the history of uh, electricity and magnetism, and go back to the days of Maxwell. Uh, people had uh, very well-defined ideas about what a field is and what a wave is. See, if you have, if you have a field and it's continuous, then a wave is just kind of a, a flow of the field, that the, the continuous field. Just like you, you, if you go in water, you think of water as somewhat continuous, and you can see waves and you can see them go and flow. And uh, so, um, so, so you have you have that uh, uh, feature, um, and the I guess the uh, the question is always what is the the medium that the wave is going in, and uh, the uh, um, the results that we say today is it's the field itself. The electromagnetic field is what the wave is in. Uh, but I just want to say of, of uh, Ampere and Faraday, and those type people, they call, instead of using the concept of field, they, they use a religious concept, the spirit of God. So, and that was how God maintained things. So, but anyway, the, the idea is you have to have some continuous source. And the question then is, wh what is the source of the field? Is the field due to the what we call the charge, or does the field have a different source? And uh, the the uh, if you look at a soliton, that field has to go off to infinity, and it gets weaker the farther away you get from the soliton, but it remains in position. And, uh, and remains continuously attacked. So uh, that's a very interesting concept. Does that answer your questions? <laughs> I can keep asking more questions if you want. <laughs> well, we do have another hour. I'm interested more in what Paul meant when he used the term. He was started off talking about waves, and as soon as he said waves, and he started defining a wave as Sine wave. Uh, I, you know, I completely lost. You know, I, I have no idea what you're talking about because I don't. I see that's just a type of wave. So I'm wondering what Paul means when he uses the word wave. I mean, that word can mean just about anything to anybody and something different to every person who uses the word. So. How do we arrive at some kind of common definition of what we're talking about when we use the word wave? Paul, would you like to comment? Oh, okay. Uh, I kind of presented what my view is, which is fairly simplistic. I won't be sure. Uh, and I started with the sine wave, which is is drawn in books as an up and down flow. Uh, and I said that seemed 
best to think a wave is, so that's what I'm going to use. And therefore, that's what I did use. I just compacted it. Or, so what uh, do you mean by up and down flow? What's flowing? Is it flowing up and down, or is it flowing right or left? It's flowing to, from uh, left to right. So the flow like, is is um, lateral to the um, oscillations. So what's it? What is it that's oscillating? Is that part of the flow? It's a ebb and flow. Is the oscillation? I, you know, the word flow doesn't mean much to me. You see what I'm driving at? Yes, I think so. Uh, the up and down, uh, the the flow, the flow up and down. Word. As soon as you said wave, that's the flow. The flow is the wave. So how can a wave be a flow? That's uh, redundant. Okay, but the uh, th there's a discussion of waves and there's a discussion of beams, and wave is a part of a beam. Uh, you well, now you've lost me because, um, you know, I don't know what a beam is. So now you're, you know, you confuse me because I don't know what you mean by wave. Now you've introduced the word beam. You confuse me because you talked about wave. Then you use the word flow. Now you're talking about beam. I don't really see, you know, any of these words mean anything to me anymore. You completely confuse me. Yeah, well, I consider the beam to be the ongoing uh, de uh, d description of what uh, starts out as a ray. So a ray of light, does that work for you? Because a ray then is a beam. Well, a ray of light basically is nothing more than um, um, that which is perpendicular to the front of the wave assuming you're talking about optics. So I don't know if you're talking about optics when you use the word beam, whether you're talking about white light, but as an electrical engineer, um, you know, when you're talking about these things, I, I have a completely different understanding of them than, than a person who is an optician would have. Okay, well, I just, uh, the, the beam or the ray is uh, essentially a straight line, uh, C. And then within that, there's uh Well, that would be basically the perpendicular to the wave front. Yeah. As usually termed in optics. But that really just basically tells you the direction in which the wave is supposed to be moving. Yes, that's, that's, what, it, that's what my beam it, or, or my ray is. But most people would say that a beam is um, that which comes out of the flashlight. So it's a term you don't like. So use ray instead of uh, beam. <laughs> well, okay. So we need to have some definitions that are understandable. No, I think that's why I was suggesting that he has, make some pictures and do some other things in the future when he's doing presentation so that um, people can see something that they can uh, identify with. Well, this problem is real fundamental. I mean, you know, basically, um, uh, you know, when I, a lot of these discussions that it exists, I find myself wrapped up in these discussions in which people are talking about things and um, they use their own definitions of terms and you know they think they're making themselves clear and what they're saying and then they get upset when you ask them to define what they mean because the word they're using means something different to me than what it, they are using the word to mean and then so you wind up basically not being able to agree on anything because you're not using the same concepts and words. I think that problem exists throughout all of physics. Its definitions are unclear all over the place. Well, I'm not going to argue that. That's it should be. They think they they you know made it pretty clear. I don't, you know, I agree that it's not necessarily 
Um, you know, soon it, you know, to me, um, uh, Bill, the big issue that you're talking about, it seems to me, is what is an electron? Okay, um, the problem, in my view, is that you have the dichotomy between the continuous and the discrete, which, um, you know, basically is an old problem that goes back thousands of years. Okay, so um, you're talking about matter, which has this um, property of being discrete. We, we think matter is discrete, okay, in the sense that atoms are made up of discrete particles, and then you can say that atoms are discrete particles themselves, and then they make up other things, okay? And at some point, the things that are produced by these discrete particles become objects that have the property of being continuous. And most people don't seem to be able to basically address how that happens. And then you have the problem of uh, if you're talking about a wave, everybody immediately assumes that if you're talking about a wave, you're talking about a medium for the wave. And is that medium continuous or is it discrete? So is the medium made up like Franklin Hughes says, all these people maintain that, well, you got to have an ether. Well, what's an ether? An ether is a bunch of particles. Okay which are discrete objects. Well, what are these discrete objects? Well, people can't say. So now you have a medium that you can't really define whether it's continuous or discrete, but most people talk about it as an ether, which makes it discrete because it's made up of particles. Now you're trying to make up particles out of something that is already composed of particles, okay? So that doesn't really, I mean, to me, the whole problem is just fraught with so many difficulties because we're not really talking about anything that people can understand in the words we're using. Uh, Michael, would you like to make a comment? Well, the uh, possibility of an ether uh, interpretation uh, raised my interest. Uh, of course, I have my own ether model, which is based on origination of uh, of, a, of an ether from a universal oscillation of a universal substrate, which was original. Space. Well, let me talk. Let me stop you right there. Okay, so you have an ether that's created out of oscillations. Well, what is an oscillation? An oscillation is a kind of wave. So now you're creating a medium for waves out of waves. What's the point in doing that? You already had waves to start with. Well, I was just getting started. I, I haven't got to uh, the point of, of waves yet, but, uh, well, an oscillation I mean, it doesn't is, make uh, any sense to create, to explain the existence of waves by creating a medium that's made up out of waves. That doesn't make any sense. Well, you have these universal ether units, which are... are, are now you're back to the particles. So now you're starting out with particles. How are you going well, to create waves out of particles? Mass they're massless. They came from original space, which was uh, a, a universal substrate, which uh, was the origin of uh, a universal ether, which is the basis of an, any ether, any logical ether theory. Well, anyway, if you, if you have these uh, units, these elemental ether units, they're very fundamental, and they would be the building blocks of everything from then on. And so uh, I'd like to... Uh, Rely on. So you're gonna, you're just gonna hypothesize that something discrete ought to exist as a fundamental subject. Well, just look at quantum entanglement. Then the entangled pair of quantum units are composed of the identical elemental units that make up the ether matrix that surrounds them, which accounts for a perfect connection between the two it quantum. Doesn't mean anything to me. Well, to me it well, does. Quantum, it's just... Well, uh, you're the only person that it means anything to. That's the whole point I've been making, which is, you know, people make up these words and talk about these things, and nobody else can understand it because they're the only person that knows what these words mean. Well, anyway, in this model, if you have a beam, that would be like a distant star coming to, to our Earth solar system and a photonic... Uh, what do you mean by resonance? beam? What's a beam? A be the beam is the, uh, the whole course of the uh of the of the light of the f photonic uh well basically etheric 
but you have a you have a, a constant interplay between quantum and etheroidal and elemental ether which is going on which is uh, what makes the wave well, let's go back let's wave... just go back to beam i don't know what beam means do you mean it in the same sense that paul means it i don't know well a beam is just the whole thing uh, coming from the distant star to uh, to our star and uh the, it's basically similar to quantum entanglement because you have similar uh, vibratory pattern to the uh, etheric uh, vibrations and uh, there can be a resonance even across vast distance of space but the waves would be the interplay of the photon quantum photon with uh, etheroidal with the, the elemental ether and it, it the wave would be like a shoreline effect where the etheric vibrational uh, dynamic is is transitioning to the uh, quantum dynamic evolving fields and waves and spin and vectors and all that it's so it's 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 a transition the wave is wave is where the transition occurs but the beam is the whole thing that goes from one place to another okay um any uh, different types of comments that people would like to make uh, we see that we have certain areas where we have different views. Uh, I might say that uh, theoretically, according to our politically correct scientific method, all scientists agree about the experimental results. What they don't agree is uh, the theory that explains the experimental results. But uh, well, I'm not really sure that that. You know, based on my experience, people don't agree about what the experimental results are, but I would assume that in science, that consensus is imposed. Is that what you mean? Uh, to some extent, yes. And uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, so you have to, when you have an experiment, the scientific community has to impose some kind of interpretation of that experiment, what it means, right? Right, right. So I'll give an example. The photoelectric effect, when it was first done by Mrs. Einstein, uh, they uh, used uh, uh, light uh, coming onto the crystalline form of various metals, and they got electrons emitted out. And so they said, well, the light must be particles, they're called photons, and that that particle can give its all of its energy to one electron and enable it to escape from an atom. But then 10 or 15 years later, they did the same experiment, but instead of using the crystalline form of the metal, they used the non-crystalline form. Uh, and then they found that the photoelectric effect does not occur. But if the if the light was really a photon, a particle, uh, it should still work no matter whether the atoms are bound in a, a crystalline lattice or not. And uh, uh, so uh, it turns out that in order to make uh, uh, optical uh, circuits for computers and things of that sort, they have finally figured out that to make them work, they have to make a little miniature antenna, just like the crystal lattice form provided, and that enables the light to be absorbed and eventually transmitted to one electron. Uh, so, um, so the light could be either a wave in the electrical engineering sense where you have to have an antenna, or it could be a particle in the billiard board sense where one particle hits another and passes on the kinetic uh, energy. Well, it turns out in optical circuits, uh, you, you can't make that work. Optical circuits only work with the wave nature of light. And, uh, but it was assumed from the original version of the uh, 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 experiments that uh, Mrs. Einstein did that, uh, that uh, light was a particle as well as a wave. But uh, if, it's, if it's not a particle and only a wave form, which is what experiments need to be telling us now, um, then uh, um, it affects a lot of quantum theory. And uh, well, now we're back to the uh, 
problem, you know, which uh, and I think you've addressed it, but, um, you know, you say, and I think there's, I like this a little bit, which is you say that the field is continuous. Okay. Well, that gives us a kind of a definition of what it is in physics that's continuous. We need to have something that we can say, this is what is continuous. And from that create waves. And then we need to say, how is it that's, what is discrete? How is that made? What does discrete mean? Is the discrete made of the continuous or is the continuous made of the discrete? They don't really have an answer in physics to that right now. Well, Winston Bostick, uh, you know, the last graduate student of Arthur Compton, uh, he uh, thought he answered that question by the experiments he did. And, uh, and um, but what we think of as particles today uh, when you see the, 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 that they're made of the electromagnetic field, uh, little wave structures called soliton, they, they really are not, not particles in the normal uh, common sense uh, idea. Uh, they, they're uh, just uh, wave structures. And uh, so, um, but we don't, we don't formally recognize that uh, in in science, and uh, it's it's interesting that uh, under the postmodern philosophy of science, we have separate silos for each dis discipline. So uh, optics is different from other fields, and has its own silo, and they determine in each silo what is true from their perspective, and so we have. We no longer have a university, we have a multiversity because each field says you're right and you're wrong. <laughs> well, nowadays, basically, um, you know, I, I'm an amateur astronomer and I go to these amateur astronomy sites and I can tell you basically, most people think light is photons and um, they'll describe a telescope as a photon gatherer. Uh, and, um, something that, that uh, collects photons, and you see this uh, continual, I mean, all the time, and it kind of, you know, makes you wonder, you know, these people, you know, out there, the, basically, pretty much the physics community is, is telling people that light is photons, it's a particle. It's not a wave, it's a particle. Okay, any other type comments or uh, suggestions that people would like to talk about? Well, are you disagreeing with that, Bill? No, I'm just trying to let all the different uh, uh, perspectives be shown. Uh, well, the I point is, the point is that, that everybody's got a different opinion, you know, and so when a person who understands the wave nature of how optics works, when, you know, how a lens works, if you use the wave model for how a lens works, they can't, uh, the people who use a particle model for uh, how light works can't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one, one comment I would make, which is, a little bit different from all these other comments, but uh, you know the uh, international standards in science has just is in the process of being changed, and uh, it is being changed in such a manner that the theories like quantum mechanics agree with it, and other theories don't, and. Uh, so it's making it very hard to continue classical science and things of this sort because of the, those changes. Um, let's see, I see Bill. Well, they're probably changing it so that light is a photon. Yeah, they're changing it so light is a photon. And, uh, the, and, and the standards are all based on that. And so the old standards that we had that were physical things that we could look at and hold and, Kind of thing, they're disappearing, and uh, 
uh, and it's it it, uh, it looks like we're going backwards <laughs> to some extent. Well, they don't they don't know the answer to the wave particle duality. There's no answer to that. They don't have a resolution, so they just arbitrarily choose one or the other. Yeah, that that's what they're doing. Uh, let's see, uh, Bill Howell, make a comment. Uh, yes, uh, Paul, uh, your concept, uh, again, in, in terms of uh, some of the complex behavior of it, uh, reminded me of a uh, recent uh, paper that came out, and I, I don't, I haven't read the actual paper in detail, uh, but that was uh, by two guys, Saint-Ange and Kunz, dealing with uh, astronomical scale plasmas. Uh, whereby they're, they're trying to explain the strength of magnetic fields um, in astronomy and, and can't seem to bridge the gap between why are these so powerful compared to what we would expect. And um, their concept is that in, in collisionless plasmas in space, there are two types of instability, uh, which I don't understand well. I've, I've looked at descriptions of them but I've never worked with them, a mirror instability and a fire hose plasma instability that give uh, rise to, uh, turbulence is probably not the right word, but sort of a, a kind of turbulence that uh, really uh, pumps up the strength of the magnetic fields. And uh, <clears throat> the funny thing is that there, the gap between observed, apparent observed, and uh, calculated uh, magnetic fields was a factor of uh, almost a trillion, uh, which, which is a, kind of a big gap. But um, they're suggesting uh, that with these instabilities in plasmas, they may actually be able to ex explain a, a good part of that. And, and this um, interacting uh, or crossing uh, waves of Paul um, kind of brought that to mind, and I'm, I guess this is a, is maybe quite distinct from what Paul is saying. But in another way, um, it, it, what Paul you've said uh, it reminded me of of sometimes there seem to be these big misunderstandings or gaps, and then you'll have categorical statements, uh, for example, that planetary motions cannot influence. Uh, sort of a, a tidal system on the sun and therefore can't explain sunspots uh, even though the data kind of correlate very well with it or somewhat well with it. So uh, here we have a situation whereby, oh, finally after maybe trouncing on, on people, scientists for, for decades, there may be an actual explanation for uh, uh, the scale of, uh, of influences in collisionless plasmas in space uh, that actually fits a bit with the uh, what's observed. Uh, Paul, I don't, I don't, ex you know, I don't know if that stimulates any thinking or comments that you have. Uh, you're talking about the uh, the uh, wave and uh, crossings and, and mass and stuff like that. Um, it kind of, re but anyways, it kind of reminds me of the turbulence type thing that you get enough of the uh, interactions and effects that you uh, might even have some supplemental effects in your model. I don't, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Paul, but <laughs> it just you just reminded me of that. Yeah, I'm not sure what it sounds like. There's a question, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Um, we might end a little early. <laughs> Actually, it started recording two hours ago. <laughs> so we've already got two hours on here. Well, right. my question would be, what kind of plasma are you talking about? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. You're talking about uh, 
uh, in stars? Are you talking about in nebulas in space or, or uh, on the surface of the sun or what? This is for uh, Bill Powell. Oh, pardon me, sir. I, I didn't realize, uh, Harry, that you were addressing me. What kind of plasmas was I talking about? Or galactic plasmas? Well, you said there's a gap of a tr trillion between, uh, you know, and I'm wondering, where, are we talking about in the sun? Uh, are we talking about sunspots? No, no, this is, this is uh, when I, yeah, I should have been uh, more clear about this. Um, it's not specific to uh, galactic or intergalactic scale uh, fields and stuff like that, or... I think it's mostly uh, on the galactic scale that the comments were referring to it, um, but it, it could also apply e even to Earth scale geomagnetic uh, plasmas. But the, I think the key word in their analysis is that if you had a, and uh, if you had a, let's say a fusion reactor, we have uh, very high densities in that you would have a lot of collisions and and therefore there's this sort of a coupling between magnetic field strength and uh, velocities within the plasma. If you go to a, a sparse collisionless plasma, and, and of course there's probably collisions in there, but nothing of the scale uh, within a high pressure plasma reactor. If you go to the as far as collisionless plasmas, and it, it kind of, the, the key behind their idea is there's a decoupling between the velocities of um, the particles, uh, individual particles, and the magnetic fields uh, of the particles and within the plasma, so that you can, you can have uh, dramatic increases in one without a corresponding in the other that in, in I guess in the conventional analysis you kind of null you know limit greatly the, uh, the field strength uh, uh, what would you call it not acceleration or leveraging or magnification or something like that so it, it's, it's kind of one of these comments that I'm not well enough first in, in the math of it and things I haven't worked with it but it, it's it's just kind of nice in the sense that you see oh well here's here's another way of looking at it and um, then all of a sudden something that was like a factor of a trillion quite a gap so you could expect that people in the past would say there's no way that you're going to get this uh, according to some magnetic or electric theory uh, about uh, the structure of galaxies or, or super clusters of galaxies and that. But now, all of a sudden, uh, what seemed to be an impossibly ridiculous idea and it has been spurned and scientists attacked in the past, wait a minute, that's, wait, wait a minute, we might be able to make sense out of that. And I'm not saying that the results are definitive, but it's, it's just the paper, so uh, there's probably a lot of different opinions about that. But it, it, it kind of reminds me a bit like this issue of can planetary motions affect sort of tidal waves on the sun? And the classical answer to that is no, absolutely not. And I've seen people get shot at so hard. And the funny thing is, uh, uh, Paul Charbonneau of the University of Montreal is a well-known uh, solar physicist, and he, he wrote a, a historical article on the first theory for sunspots was planetary-induced um, tidal action on the sun. And that has come up every seven years or ten years ever since. There's <laughs> a group that reinvents it, which is natural, right? I, I believe in multiple asynchronous invention. It happens all the time, and people are thinking, and it's good to see. But every seven or ten years, then people come out and, and destroy it, saying the physics tell you this cannot happen. And I've always suspected that um, there's a bit of a problem using the one over r squared relationship when you're dealing with uh, 
something that isn't just necessarily an electrostatic thing. It may have to do a lot more with uh, current uh, flows and, and magnetic fields, which are not. Uh, I, I guess even a beam of light spreads. So there's normally spreads or, or let's say an antenna. You have directional antenna, which can focus a radio uh, beam, but it does kind of spread in a conical frac frac fraction, one over r squared. But doesn't attenuate to the same extent. Uh, it, at least it maintains a certain level of power better than if it was just a spherical radiation pattern. And um, I also want to talk about, for example, Birkeland currents in space uh, between the planets and the sun, which uh, again you see arguments saying that that's BS. There's no data. There's no no data there to prove that they actually exist, uh, which echo the comments that. It's insane to suggest that there the, the could ever be a solar wind between the sun and the earth. That's just nuts. And there's no proof of that at all. And, and it took a long time for people to kind of warm, warm up to the idea. But if, if there are current uh, streams um, in space, and if you have a Birkeland current, which is a, um, let's just conceive of it as a line, like a, transmission line, but it's it's not a, a copper or, or other type of metal wire, it's actually a fuzzy uh, plasma-like stream, then um, does that one over R squared relationship really, really apply that well? And what are the end effects in terms of shear forces on, on the receiver on the two bodies? And what are the... Uh, the um, along the line of the Birkeland current forces of attraction or repulsion. And all of a sudden, well, wait a minute, that one over R squared rule, if you're talking about a line and you ignore dissipation and losses, it's not a one over R squared, it's an R to the zero, basically a non-attenuating situation, which, which probably doesn't exist because of all the losses and propagation to the side and all that. But another one that was kind of really interesting two, two to four years ago was that Donald Scott did an analysis of uh, Birkeland currents uh, for space and, and uh, came up with, uh, well, these Birkeland currents, the, it doesn't have a one over R relationship transversal to the direction of the line of the Birkeland current. It's a one over square root R, which is a huge difference. Totally changes a lot. And um, I, I haven't, I've seen a criticism of, you know, usually will see vitriolic criticism when somebody says something like that. But I went through his initial paper on that. Uh, I don't know if that was actually getting that published in a, a normal journal, but he put out what he had online. I had some reservations about part of that, but I think those reservations were basically really a manifestation of my own limitations of a keep my head around the idea, but it, it, it's a nice concept. Anyways, that's, a, that's a, I'm talking, blabbering away way too much here, but it's just this kind of interesting thing that somebody brings up a point like Paul, and then, I, oh, okay, well, just a minute. And, and the other one was solitons, by the way. Uh, is those fire holes and mirror instabilities, and I think in description of somewhere in this description of the glucialist plasma. Solitons were one of two um, kind of byproducts of one of these instability processes. And, and Bill Lucas, he'd been talking about uh, solitons for, for a very long time and uh, have, have repeatedly commented that this is very, tends to be a very stable uh, structure for dynamic structure, I guess is the way you say it. And uh, it's not just in your concepts of electrons or protons. It's, it's also if you have a, uh, if you blow a smoke ring, I guess you would say. And I think you had a lot of other examples of that. And I forget what they were of soliton. But then you, you keep seeing some of these ideas coming up. And uh, that's kind of what Paul was stimulating in, in, in me when I was listening to his talk a bit. Like, 
Paul, you weren't exactly getting into those, those things directly, but it, it, it kind of, kind of brings, brings up those issues to me. And Bill, I, other than going back to Terry Richter's, how, okay, where do we define discrete and continuous? And I guess I'm in an engineering sense, I'm kind of used to like a dimensional analysis perspective on it that you tend to get transitions from different phases or regimes of the system uh, all the time. But um, the soliton has resonant frequencies, and you get into the uh, quantum levels for the electrons based on that. We also uh, got into the fractional quantum levels, which was, was just fascinating. And when I, I looked at that, I first saw that in Maryland at some point in time, and I just thought, that's, that's just nuts. I mean, it's a really fun idea, and it, it kind of makes more sense to look at it. Um, it's not to throw one idea out or, or, or just focus on another idea. It's, it's, um, I, I love multiple conflicting hypotheses. But it, it's, it's still very hard for me, Gary uh, brings this out, right? It's still hard for me to uh, not get trapped into saying, well, but the electron is the soliton. And you're not really talking about subparticles when you're talking about the waves. But it's hard for me to shift away from a particle type thinking. I'm kind of thinking of little components of electrons circulating around rather than waves. And uh, I, I, this is this just isn't resolved for me. And by the way, uh, uh, the other place I uh, source I'd heard of for. Uh, Fractional quantum levels is a uh, really highly, uh, what would you call it, uh, ostracized and hated scientist. He's been attacked for for his entire career, and it's a guy, Randall Mills, with his uh, theory of fractional quantum levels and um, hydrinos, uh, hydrogen atoms at different fractional levels of the uh, free electron. And uh, so that was kind of, I did take a close look at a, uh, a review, a kind of an overview book of his work. I haven't actually got his uh, main uh, treatise on, on his concepts, but I haven't actually gone through that. I don't have the time to do that now. So, uh, you know, uh, Mill's concept is not a soliton. His concept is a, a spherical hollow shell, again with this issue of resonances at different levels and with uh, varying distributions of the uh, waves or circulation in that shell to explain the quantum levels. Now, I, su I suspect that your work um, did relate to some earlier work, but is earlier than what Mills did probably in I can't remember, let's say 1980s, early 90s or something like that. Uh, but, but this is kind of a, uh, a struggle for me. Is uh, Again, you said it's nice to have extras in that, but I think uh, it's also nice, it would be nice for me one of these days to have the time to go a bit more into the math and, and uh, what are the definitions here. I, I'm, you know, there's this confusion over you have a soliton, there are standing waves at different frequencies that explain very well the fractional levels and uh, integer levels of quanta for the external, the free, they're not free electrons, they're external to the nucleus neutrons, uh, electrons. Uh, and I don't know, do you have any comments on that? Paul or Bill? <laughs> or Harry? <laughs> Uh, I can make a few comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm a uh, the guy who did my PhD uh, working in theoretical physics, and I performed experiments at the Space Radiation Effects Laboratory where we made beams of various particles and scattered them off of other particles. 
And uh, one of the things that we did is we scattered electrons off of protons. And when we did that, we were able to see that the proton consisted of three internal structures. And those internal structures are now called quarks. But we also were able to measure the charge of those internal structures. And we found that they were 2 thirds E and 1 third E, where E is the charge of the electron. And so then the question came up, well, uh, if the fundamental charge in uh, uh, protons is a fraction, one third or two thirds of E, then maybe that's the basic building block of all uh, structure, all elementary particles. In terms of charge, it's not the total charge E, and the electron would consist of three uh, sub systems just like the proton does, but they would be simpler subsystems. And uh, so if you look at it from that perspective and you say, well, uh, if I believe in E equals MC squared, uh, can I predict the mass of all the observed elementary particles that have mass and some that don't? And uh, the answer to that is yes, you can. And uh, the standard model of elementary particles takes between 19 and 29 adjustable constants representing unknown physics in order to do that. But if you if you use the soliton approach, you can predict them all with no adjustable constants. And so that's a, a very big point to make. And uh, but uh, <clears throat> When you start looking more closely at the data of a soliton, and you know, we think of a charge as something like a billiard ball. <laughs> you know, it has a, a, a surface, it has a, a, a finite extent, but the, uh, the soliton picture doesn't give that to you. It, it has the, the, because of the continuity, the uncuttable nature of the field, uh, it uh, extends out to great distances. And so we just like we can't say that the size of a tornado is the size of the funnel, <laughs> we have to say, well, you know, it's the size of, uh, uh, of the big storm that's producing it. And um, that is affected by the, the, the bigger movements of air on the surface of the earth. And you could say, well, the whole earth is really contributing to that. And it's not just that little storm that you see that's over one continent that's producing the tornado. And uh, so, so anyway, we, we, we can see to some extent that our uh, concepts, physical concepts of what a charge is, is merely a mathematical approximation. And uh, so, um, that's what I think we need to to consider. So, uh, so anyway, those those are a number of interesting comments, and it shows us that our our concepts in science are not as precise as we would like to think. Uh, and so, if we if we if we talk about charge as being an approximation, then mass. Uh, which we can calculate is also based on that approximation because our formula for the mass is in terms of charge. And so uh, the uh, it, it really uh, becomes uh, complicated. And, um, and it shows us that um, not all of our concepts are perfect. We would like to have a perfectly smooth round ball like a billiard ball uh, for for the charge, but but we don't have that, and uh, uh, and we, we we don't have anything that uh, we can measure that is uh, precise like that, and that's been causing a lot of problems in in science, and uh, so let's see. I see Michael has raised his flag. Do you have something to say, Michael? 
Well, this is my ether theory, so it gets kind of esoteric and uh, un, un, unempirical, but the idea that uh, a proton could be composed of an electronic uh, content goes along with uh, the uh, idea of creation, of uh, that there was a preceding ether world and that an electron uh, projection was, was projected into the ether, which... The ether being the fat, I mean, the electron being the speediest unit, and uh, then uh, through entrainment and linkages, uh, form larger units, protons and neutrons, and then the, uh, the speedy electrons described curvational arcs around the nuclear units. So it does kind of correlate in a way. Of course, charge is, charge is something that correlates with the quantum atomic world that we live in now. But uh, the idea is that there was an earlier ether macrocosm which was magnetically unstable so they had to create a, a quantum atomic world for magnetic stability and that's how they did it by projecting the electron first and into the ether and then everything sort of fell together like that yeah well i i find it interesting that the first philosopher according to the greeks the proto philosopher whose name they they uh, would spell Moshe, M-O-S-H-E. We would call it Moses, the Hebrew lawgiver. But anyway, he he uh, promoted the idea that uh, all matter was made of uh, a, a monad and an anti-monad, which is kind of correlating to a soliton and anti-soliton. And... Uh, uh, and that's what we're getting back to after thousands of years. But, you know, at the very beginning, the Greeks thought that was a very good description of how things were uh, put together. And they said, uh, like uh, uh, Plato said on the door of his uh, uh, what do you call it? Not the university, but But uh, electron, but they are uh, smaller than a proton. We call them quarks, but we see they're fractional charges, and so um, it tells us that those are made of something smaller than an electron, and uh, so. You know, we don't know how many of the smaller things are there, and uh, but if you can make a consistent theory that shows that, for instance, the electromagnetic force has chiral symmetry, that means it's left-handed, right-handed, and mirror symmetry, uh, that tells you that only certain structures can be stable uh, in uh, if you're going to put them together in terms of monads. And uh, or solitons, and so you project what that is, and then you see if you can cor make a correspondence between that and the current set of elementary particles that we observe experimentally, and it turns out you can, and then you can predict the way they'll come apart or decay, and what the components will be, and if you conserve uh, solitons <laughs> and all that sort of thing. Uh, you uh, find an energy, you find that you uh, can describe or predict all the decay modes for each of the elementary particles. And that's uh, a, a significant uh, uh, success, I think, to, to give. Of course, we may still find more elementary particles, but it's interesting that the Higgs boson is not predicted by this method. All the data that we have been able to measure with accelerators is predicted related to elementary particles. So, um, but we have a lot of theories and the theories require different things for confirmation. And so we, we, uh, we, we invent things to make that work. Just like in the case of general relativity, it didn't explain the gravitational field of the earth that you get out of our solar system as you get out near the edge 
nor did it explain the gravitational field in spiral galaxies as you get out to the edge of uh, the outer spiral arms. And so we invented dark matter and dark energy to supplement the theory because it wasn't working. And uh, now the dark matter is 96% uh, of the universe and uh, regular matter and energy is 4%. And that is crazy. And we've never been able to experimentally confirm that dark matter exists because we can't seem to make it in accelerator experiments or reactor experiments and we think that we should. Uh, quantum mechanics would say we could anyway. <laughs> And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy world we live in. And uh, the, um, because of the way the, the politicizing of science, uh, you can't get funding unless you agree with the, gr the group that has the money. And so, <laughs> okay, so Bill, question. Yeah. Uh, what is charge? Is charge an attribute, a property, or a thing, or a something? Well, Let's let's say look at and to ask the question a little differently. How? Do well, I'm just trying to answer the question to sort of. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I, the the way is I it, is it an attribute or what? Uh, the only way we even know that there is something we call charge is through field measurements. Correct. And so, uh, so now, uh, if we have a structure in the field. You know, that's going to measure the same as if we had a, 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 um, a ball <laughs> that was a, a charge, you know, that had physical something called charge. And uh, so we can't really make that distinction uh, as well as we would like. And uh, but I think that the fact that we can construct a logical theory that can predict uh, things that other concepts of charge could not predict makes one one uh, concept better than another. And uh, well, the current way physics is doing it is is that they say that the charge creates the field. Right. But it could also be that the field create is, is really creates the charge. So you yeah. know, there is no answer to this dilemma. Oh well, there is. <laughs> and that is charge flows between galaxies, not charge, but the current flows between galaxies. And we can see it, we can measure it. And one person says, well, you know, this is really going fast, faster than a physical charge would go. How, how can they do that? And uh, so, that's a, just a, a, a question, and uh, and also uh, what causes it to move a distance between one galaxy and another, which is a huge distance, and uh, and uh, why are there specific patterns of the uh, charge flowing, and and it looks like it's not due to uh, um, one one or two sources of charge, but it due to something even bigger than that, something that's a universal scale. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's a question that's hard to answer, particularly if you don't uh, want to even consider uh, religious type concepts. And being a religious person, I do consider those concepts, but this is not the right venue for that, I don't think. Uh, but uh, yeah. Well, it seems so, to me that charge is, is just a, a kind of a, a, a word or a concept that, that is used to uh, attribute to something that is said to be a cause of it. So charge is said yeah. to be the cause of the field. But is it actually a something or a thing, or is it just an attribute of the field, whatever that is? I think the charge is just a... a uh, an approximate way to um, uh, describe uh, a field structure like a soliton. And uh, so uh, when, when we think of like the electron it, and we start thinking in terms of a charge, well, the electron's got 
a mass. The electrons got uh, a certain amount of energy in it. Uh, it's got a magnetic moment. It's got uh, a, a field coming out, and it's got spin. All of those can be measured, and so uh, the structure becomes complicated <laughs> of what a charge is. And then <clears throat> when you see that the fields are continuous. Uh, because we, we measure both magnet, the three types of electric fields and the three types of magnetic fields are continuous. Uh, then we, we uh, and we measure the strength, the tensile strength of the field, and we, we say, oh, this is stronger than gravity. Uh, it, it, uh, it explains why we, 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 we don't really talk about action at a distance. We're just talking about uh, you know, action conveyed through these fields, uh, which have tensile strength, and that's how the forces are conveyed. And uh, so it's uh, it's interesting that uh, you see that. And 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 I don't know if you realize it, but in modern times, in the last 10, 15 years, um, NIST measured the um, mass of the nuclear isotopes to H significant figures for the first time. And when our theories of strong interaction and weak interaction were invented, they were only measuring it to four significant figures. And now we're measuring it to eight significant figures. We no longer have any evidence that those forces exist. So the only two forces that we really have are gravity and uh, uh, electromagnetic force. And if you can derive the force of gravity from electrodynamics, then you've just got one force. And uh, so. That's the kind of stuff that's going on, and uh, people um, don't like to uh, address some of these issues because it uh, invalidates so many theories that people have received Nobel prizes for and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, it's not a popular thing to talk about. Okay, uh, other comments are, uh, we have 15 more minutes, we can talk if we want, and then uh, we'll close the uh, meeting up. But uh, up and we have a few more minutes if you want to talk about some other subjects. Uh, Bill Howell here. Uh -huh. um, I was going to comment on, on uh, that newsletter you had a couple of years ago mentioning the NIST data, and uh, had had forgotten a bit about the strong and weak nuclear forces being kind of uh, questioned by that. Uh, but if, if we go to the fractional quantum levels of electrons, um, I think as you go to a higher and higher, well, excuse me, a, a lower and lower number, or the denominator is higher and higher. Uh, so you go, say, one half, a third, a quarter. Um, the size or distance of the electron from the uh, supposed nucleus in a conventional Bohr type matter that would get larger. Um, but I think in, in the case you have been using uh, the soliton structures which kind of look a bit like hula hoops. Yeah. Right angles uh, going out in, of different sizes and dimensions. Um, it's a little hard to get a feel for. It's, it's, it's kind of beautiful in a way. What, what Do you have a limit to the fractional level of an electron? Uh, in Randall Mill's case, he said it pretty well looks like it would stop at 1 divided by 137, at which point in his model it would, you would have a attaining the speed of light. And, and that would be the end of the concept, and you would end up with a, you know, just one step more, you would end up with a free electron and a proton uh, from a hydrogen atom. Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering, did you have a kind of a limit to the fractional quantum level? Well, um, I've done scattering experiments with electrons. So if I take two electron beams and I scatter, one against the other, and I'm scattering them at 
one or two electron volts, I measure a size for the electron, for the solitons that make it up. If I now increase that energy to millions of electron volts, all the electron shrinks. And okay. So, so the question is, well, how big is the electron when it's at rest? And the question is, where is something at rest? You're well, right. when the sun, the sun's moving around the, the the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is moving around the center of the universe, or whatever you know. All that motion's going on. Where can I find a particle at rest? But wait, wait a minute. That led into kind of a second part of the thinking on that that question, and that is um, the 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 neutron as an electron proton pair in a sense, which which kind of I think conventional physics kind of alludes to in a way, but adds in uh, whatever it is, uh, neutrinos or whatever being admitted uh, when they break up. But what is the nuclear state of an electron? Is that kind of like the uh, electron at rest? But in the hula hoop model, what does that even mean? Because the key thing about hula hoops is that you're not having uh, a structure and move motion of an electron that violates physics in the, in the sense that synchrotron radiation would be the consequence of the standard models. So what's an electron at rest? And, and what, what does it mean? What's the uh, nuclear form? How does that relate to the, uh, the electron scattering from way back, you know, the diffraction pattern? Yeah, well, I guess the, the electron at rest would tell you what the minimum size or, or the maximum size of the, of the electron would be. And what the what the maximum mass would be, uh, or not, not the maximum mass, the minimum mass would be. And uh, uh, so we don't know that for sure because we don't know how fast everything is moving, <laughs> and we don't know what the proper reference frame is. Although uh, <clears throat> when we we derive the force of gravity from electrodynamics. We got a force of gravity that could explain the gravity of our solar system and the gravity of a spiral galaxy, such that we don't need dark matter and dark energy. We can precisely predict what's observed. Um, so that means that maybe we know something more uh, about gravity. We know it has an electrodynamic origin. And what it is, it's the average force between bodies that consist of spherical distributions of dipoles, quadrupoles, octopoles, that sort of thing for the atoms. And uh, when they have this distribution, the, most of the electromagnetic force balances out, but the vibrations that are in these things produce a net effect that doesn't cancel out, and that produces the force of gravity. But it's so weak it's 10 to the minus 39th power as strong as the electromagnetic Coulomb force. So, you know, <clears throat> it's a very weak effect, but then we call that gravity, and, and we're able to uh, measure it and that sort of thing. So, uh, so we have some confirmation, and uh, uh, in the work I've been doing, um, once I, I realized that the electromagnetic force might be the universal force, I then became interested in other questions like, well, if that's true, then you should be able to say something about life. What causes life? How does it come about? It doesn't come about the way our uh, people who uh, want to... Uh, describe it in terms of biology and chemistry and, and uh, that sort of thing because uh, we have found that there are two forms of the electromagnetic field. There's transverse and there's longitudinal. And the longitudinal one 
we see everything that it, it that we can identify as being alive has is giving off longitudinal radiation and things that are dead don't give off longitudinal radiation and so we we see that and uh, we uh, uh, there's just so many things that seem to uh, be able questions that seem to be able to be answered which we didn't know before and the the evolutionary experiments that were done in the at early atmosphere of the Earth, presumably, that uh, would produce uh, various uh, molecules that would uh, be the precursors for organic molecules. Uh, when we measure life energy there, they don't have any. And so we don't know how to put life energy into something that doesn't have life energy. And of course, the old rule in, in biology is that life comes from life. And so, well, where's the first life come from? Don't know. And uh, so, uh, we can't. Can I make a quick comment on that? It's uh, kind of another puzzle. So sometimes you see this huge gap between observations and available explanations, uh, like uh, with those collisionless plasmas and magnetic fields in space. Right. But another one is. Kind of a strange incompletion of a thought that that you know a scientist must be thinking about, but doesn't actually explicit sta explicitly state. In this case, it's Gerald Pollock, and he didn't like the term "easy water." Forget what he called it, but it was the uh, hexagonal sheets of uh, sort of the fourth phase of water, a gel-like phase, but um, he had this thing where he was doing electric batteries of water only. And um, the electrochemical uh, potential was coming from the difference between the, the gel-like phase at the uh, glass surface of a body or, na I think, Nafian membrane sometimes or something, and, and the bulk water in the interior. And he did discuss... Uh, some ideas kicking around with the origins of life, I think, a bit, but he didn't actually make any statement in the, in even one of his more recent books that, well, here you have an extremely simple source of electrochemical potential that is regenerated by the sun in water and that you could combine with concepts like Stu Coffin's uh, on the edge of chaos type theories for the origin of life when they were trying to do calculations of how life arose from complexity. But he never actually came out and said, wow, here's a source of really simple, uh, quite mild and controllable, very low level, not competitive with modern pilot systems. But, it, you know, he never actually said, well, here's maybe one of the really key components of the origins of life, perhaps. If, if life originated in water, uh, you would have this uh, electrochemical water battery um, that could be very easily used and uh, uh, might have contributed to the origins of life. I don't know if you've ever noticed, noticed that in his work. Um, I have been at the Electric Universe, a speaker myself there, and uh, met him and heard some of his presentations. Um, <clears throat> there is some other work that uh, is greatly opposed in the medical field, but uh, during World War II, a French doctor who was in medical school was drafted. His name was Anton Prior, and uh, he was assigned to a radar unit. And he uh, noticed that, uh, well, first of all, the, the French received their food at their military encampments in bushel baskets, not packaged up and processed like we do today. And uh, he noticed that the food, the fruits and vegetables that were delivered to his radar unit were put at the base of the big antenna. And uh, apparently it's a convenient place. But he noticed it didn't go bad. And then one day he walked about 10 miles away to another infantry unit 
and they he looked at their food supply and he discovered it was going bad as he was used to seeing at home and uh so he told them, well, you should get your food from where we get ours because ours doesn't go bad. And they said, well, we both get our food from the same place. And then he realized, oh, there's something going on around that radar antenna, I think, that's causing the food not to go bad. So he went back and asked his commanding officer if he could move the food away for a while to see if it would decay like it did in other places. And he got permission, and he moved the food, and sure enough, it started decaying when he got far enough away from the antenna. And he put it back. And uh, then after the war was over, and he finished medical school, he became a veterinarian, and uh, he bought some surplus antennas and had electrical engineers study it. And they said, there's two kinds of radiation that comes off this antenna. There's transverse radiation, and there's longitudinal. The transverse is used for the radar function. The longitudinal is just ignored. And it's not very strong. That's why you didn't have to move the food very far away. But the, radio, the longitudinal energy recharged the life energy in the molecules of the food. And so that they would last longer without the king. And uh, so he got the idea, well, I wonder what would happen if I took a sick animal and radiated them with this longitudinal radiation. And the engineers, electrical engineers said, we can make you a stronger uh, source of a longitudinal light. We'll make a two-story building and make a big uh, uh, plasma type of light that produces this longitudinal radiation. And they said, uh, and you will need to change the frequency perhaps because some diseases may be responding differently to different frequencies. So they built him this big light source, and uh, it had a gurney underneath, and he put the animals on there and radiated them. And he found that by changing the frequency, he could get them well from 92 different diseases that animals get, including things like cancer, a lot, a lot of things that were the bad health things. and. Uh, he is becoming well known in Europe. People brought their prized farm animals and their pets to him. And then one day, one of the fellows that he was with in the military became the president of France. And his wife became terminally ill with cancer. And she was uh, treated with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, radical surgery, the whole works. And she was dying. David wasn't helping. So he came to him and said, will you radiate my wife? I understand you've radiated, radiated animals that had cancer and they got well. He said, yeah, but I, I only have a license to do animals. And the president said, no problem. I'll bring you one tomorrow. I'm the president. I can get it done. <laughs> so he brought him a license and he radiated this man's wife and she got well. And they began to realize, oh, <clears throat> you can cure at least 92 different diseases probably for humans that these animals get and it doesn't require any medicine it doesn't even require a doctor it doesn't have any side effects and so the french government gave him the anton prior millions of dollars to start doing people instead of animals because of President said people are more important than animals. And, uh, but then uh, after about five or six months, someone hired the mafia to kill this man and everyone who worked in his laboratory. And this was in the 70s before we had internet. But on the internet, you can see all the laboratory, the big cell, the big uh, light source, launching the light source. You can see um, the, the Testimonies of people who got well, whose animals got well from this radiation, but people are afraid to use it. And it's illegal in the United States to use it because it's not registered with the Food and Drug Administration. <clears throat> and no one will pay to measure it because uh, to, to get it, uh, because they, they can't make the money to pay off the cost, the millions of dollars to get it registered. So 
uh, but there that data is out there and uh, uh, and some people have done it and the Chinese are currently making a handheld laser that has a crystal beyond where the laser beam is created and it converts that from transverse radiation to longitudinal. And they claim they are going to eliminate the entire medical profession, except for, you know, setting bones when you're in an accident or something like that. But it, and that was featured in the movie Star Trek, <laughs> and they called it the tricorder. So we've known about that for a long time. It's just that uh, we don't want to admit that we know a little bit about the source of life, but we can make a longitudinal light, but if you put the light on something that is dead, nothing happens. It doesn't become alive. If you put it on something that is alive but dying, it can recover. But it has to be alive to start with. But there's a piece of data missing here that I'm waiting for. I'm watching to see if uh, you turn up 20 years of age one of these days. <laughs> I'm getting older, so I'm kind of hoping somebody's going to come up with the elixir of youth. Um, it can keep... you from dying of didn't perform like one of the possibilities that Anton Prior could have done was food processing but he found you had to keep on processing it with this light or it would go bad the food would so it's not like you you process it and then you freeze it and and it lasts for thousands of years you know or something like that uh, they they uh, the life energy decays even if it's frozen and uh, and you can measure the decay with this. The, there's a, an experimental life energy meter that measures longitudinal radiation that's for sale on the internet. Just Google experimental life energy meter and you can see it. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it, in the short term, it can keep you living longer. In the long Well, the, the question of uh, life, uh, as soon as someone dies, in, in, way inside the cells, the mit mitochondria, the uh, microorganelles become autolyzed by the uh, intracellular enzymes. And so when you're dead, you're dead. I mean, there's no way to return it if you've really been, you know, it doesn't take long at all for those in very, very tiny uh, intracellular organelles to uh, decay and, and become unsustainable. As far as uh, the origin of life, uh, I think magnetic monopoles is something to look at. There was a, a researcher, or maybe still alive, William Callahan, Dr. William Callahan, who's done a lot of work on magnetic monopoles. Those are one, dynamically one-way uh, systems, which are not not easy to produce uh, in a quantum setting, but maybe in, a, in an earlier etheric world, maybe you could have had energies that that had magnetic monopoles produced that could have started uh, reproductively uh, reproducible uh, systems in, in that kind of an energy, ether energy setting maybe. Thanks for the comment. 